So in the previous video, we were able to see how Mendel tested the blending inheritance hypothesis, and more specifically, how he was able to reject it, based off of the evidence that he got from his observations, and then the conclusion that he made that the blending is simply not possible. He came up with this idea of particulate inheritance, which is a much, much better way to describe the passing on of traits, the passing on of what he called hereditable factors. And we know that these factors are passed on by parent one or parent two, combining together to form an offspring. And we ended the video on talking about this idea of masking things, of genes actually being present. A name to those hereditable factors would be genes. Now we can sort of go further into this idea of looking at genes by giving some names to some very important characteristics based off of what I like to call Mendel's model. So we're going to be looking at Mendel's model in great, great detail. And what I mean by model, I mean uh, is, are the experiments that he con conducted and the conclusions and laws that came out of his experiments. So there are going to be a couple of these flowcharts. We'll start with Mendel's model one. Some background information. These are very important terms that you should know, especially their origins and what they mean, because it's, we're, once we've established them, we're going to be using them a lot, especially as we move forward with genetics. So it's very, very important to get a strong background knowledge of what Mendel was talking about. So first and foremost, a term that you must absolutely know is the idea of an allele. An allele is simply defined as an alternate version of a gene. Simple enough. Now, we talked about this a little bit when we mentioned the difference between a character, which is something that's just simply passed on, uh, characteristic like hair color or plant color or seed color that's passed on, and then the trait, which is the variant of that, whether it's purple, whether it's yellow, similar to that, but now we are mentioning this idea of a gene. So it's important to realize we're getting more specific. We're getting much more genetically accurate with this idea of an allele. More specifically, we can mention that an allele is found at the same locus, its location is at the same locus on homologous chromosomes. That means that every pair of homologous chromosomes has how many alleles? Two, correct? Because if we have a homologous pair of chromosomes like this, and I draw an allele right here, that means it must have at the same locus another one right there. So that's what we mean by at the same locus, an alternate version of a gene. When we say alternate version, where is the alternate part of it? What makes it different? Well, from a genetic standpoint, an allele actually varies slightly in nucleotide sequence. So we'll say varies slightly in nucleotide sequence. Now, I know we haven't talked about DNA in great detail, but what we simply mean by nucleotide sequence is that imagine nucleotides as the building blocks of DNA, like A, T, C, and G, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine. Those things are building blocks. What we notice about alleles is that, let's say this allele right here has a very sort of a similar uh, distribution of nucleotides, but different by, let's say, one or two or three letters. That's all we mean. This, let's imagine this gene is uh, something like ATCG, and its allele on the other side is like AACG. A difference of one nucleotide changes it. And that's simply what we mean by varying slightly in nucleotide sequence. That's all an allele is. Now, to get a better idea of what Mendel meant by an allele, we can look at each chromosome. And we've sort of done that already over here. If we look at each chromosome, specifically each homologous pair of chromosomes, how many of those do we have? We have 23 homologous pairs, giving us 46 total chromosomes. Each one has two copies of a gene. Okay, And because each one has two copies of a gene, these copies you can imagine as simply alleles. Instead of saying two copies now, we can use a very strong genetic term known as alleles. Those two copies, though, it's not, a, it's not that accurate to say that they're exact copies because remember, an allele is an alternate version of a gene. So now we're getting a lot more specific in our genetic terminology. Instead of just saying copies, now we can say each chromosome has two alleles of every single gene. Now those two alleles can be either identical to each other, this does happen, and we see this a lot, or they can be different. Now, if they're identical, we are looking at a true breed. 
we are looking at something that has the same exact allele on both homologous pairs, on both homologous chromosomes. And because of that, we're going to have a true breed. But I think the most interesting part, well, we start seeing an interesting sort of relationship to Mendel's studies, his uh, overall experiments, are when we see different alleles. So if we imagine this being one allele, allele one, and this being allele two, if they are slightly different from each other, we have two consequences. We can, we then always will see a dominant allele, and we will also then see, you've probably heard of these terms, a recessive allele. You see these two consequences if the alleles are different. And if they're different, and if one of them is dominant, the dominant allele is the one that's always physically seen. What I mean by this is that simply when you look at the organism, you see the dominant allele being expressed. Now you don't see that its gene is literally expressed. What you see is the actual phenotype, physical phenotype. You would see the color of the plant. You would see the shape of the seed. That's what we mean by physically seen. The recessive allele on this sort of end is then the masked allele. Remember how we talked about masks in our previous video? It's the one that gets sh overshadowed by the dominant allele because the dominant allele is the one that's physically seen. But the recessive allele can very much and very well is still there. It's just that it's masked. It is not expressed. So let's imagine one of these alleles is uh, the big G, and the other one is little g. We don't need to worry about the denotion yet of big and little g, but just imagine this is dominant, this is recessive. Big G being dominant will be the physically seen allele. This means that if I have big G at this plant color, or let's say seed color gene right here, this is the seed color gene, this is the seed color gene, both of them are alleles. If it's big G, then that seed color will definitely be green. It will not be this little g whatever color this little g represents. Um, it could represent a different shade of green or um, it actually represents yellow, but we don't need to get into those specifics just yet. So, the last thing I want to talk about in this video is the law of segregation. Now, out of everything that Mendel has done, he created two very important laws and the first one is the law of segregation. Now it's a bit wordy, but we're going to just work through this definition. And I'll write it out and then explain it. So the definition is the two alleles for a hereditable character, hereditable character, I'll just write C-A-R-C, oh, I can fit it here. Uh, two alleles for a hereditable character are going to segregate. Let's put that in capital letters so that we know this is where the name comes from. This is where the law comes from. Two alleles are going to segregate during a very interesting and very important phase known as gamete formation. We talked about gamete formation. You can, we'll talk about that in just a second. And end up in different gametes. So, very wordy definition, but let's work through it right now. The two alleles, just like these right over here, for a hereditable character, let's say plant color or seed color, are going to segregate, meaning separate, during gamete formation. We have talked about gamete formation. We specifically talked about gamete formation when we looked at meiosis. Meiosis was all figuring out how do we make sperm and egg, but specifically how do we denote the chromosomal arrangement, the chromosomal, let's say, amount to create the gametes that are necessary during that process and end up in different gametes. More specifically, what we can state about the law of segregation is that it denotes the distribution of two members of a homologous chromosome. What does that mean? Simply speaking, when we look at a homologous chromosome, what we end up seeing in terms of these genes, in terms of these alleles, is that the alleles end up in different gametes. And we saw this. We saw this ending up in different gametes, two separate daughter cells during what phase? During anaphase. Remember what anaphase was all about? Separating the homologous chromosomes. Separating them because we want to put them into different gametes. 
In addition, if we mention that idea of identical alleles one more time, identical alleles would be the situation in which all gametes have the same particular allele. All gametes have same particular allele. So all the gametes that have the allele for, let's say, green seed color are going to be identical alleles. But again, the interesting one, the thing that Mendel definitely noticed more so and cared definitely a lot about was the idea of different alleles. Different alleles distributed very, very interestingly in the sense that half of the gametes get one allele and half get the other. But remember how we said that this is not, uh, we sort of talked about the idea of half and half in the blending inheritance hypothesis, and we proved that it's not the blending of half of mom's genes and half of dad's genes. Then where does this come from? What we start noticing are nuances. What we start noticing are different variations. What we start noticing is that some alleles are dominant. Some are recessive. Some of them will show up. Some of them won't show up. Some of them will show up based off of the genotype and the phenotype, things that we're going to be talking about. But the end-all, be-all of the law of segregation is that this itself, this law, is what's going to account, and um, we'll say underneath all of this, accounts for, and just know this for right now, we'll talk about it more specifically in the next video, accounts for the 3 to 1 ratio seen in F2 generation. Now, we're running a little short on time in this video, but overall, what we understand from Mendel's model, the initial things we want to understand are the idea of an allele being an alternate version of a gene and each chromosome possessing two different alleles. Those two different alleles can then either be identical, sometimes they're identical, then of course, they're not actual alternate versions, they're the same, but then most interestingly is when they're different. They can be dominant or recessive, and then we see different patterns. And one of the patterns that we see, one of the laws that we see, are the law of segregation that two alleles separate from each other, that segregate from each other, that give us different gametes. Some gametes will have the green color, some gametes will have the yellow color, some gametes will have round seeds, some gametes will have wrinkled seeds. These are the things that are going to help with variation. The law of segregation is one of the most important reasons for variation. We'll get into that as we move forward along with this series.